Welcome to Black Optical TV. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have the founders of District Vision, Tom and Max, joining us. Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thanks. Black Optical is our favorite. It's the only optical store we, we really love in the world, I would say. Oh, I like how you start with a very controversial statement to begin. <laughs> <laughs> The message we just, the optical store. <laughs> we just get straight into it. <laughs> uh, that means a lot to us. We appreciate that, Max. I told him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump into some, some questions then. But tell us the vibe there in uh, New York City right now. Obviously, it's super challenging times, and you guys are really in the heart of it here in the US. Tell us what's going on in New York City. How are you guys feeling? What's the vibe? Yeah, I think uh, it's very humbling. Uh, first of all, I think there's a there's a real respect for one another and for people on on an individual level and understanding kind of how companies can contribute that and where kind of how individuals intersect with companies and what we can all do to 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 rectify and work through this together. Um, New York's always had that kind of quintessential urban uh kind of community i think that that has been revered over the years but to see it firsthand is a very different thing and i'll just give one example uh, every evening at 7 p.m everyone opens their windows and bangs drums and shouts and screams and claps and we just happen to be uh going for a walk yesterday at seven to get some some groceries and stuff and it's unbelievable. I mean, everyone's got their windows open, they're banging, clapping, screaming, shouting, and like celebrating one another. And you kind of look at that and you're kind of like, ah, oh, might be nice to have a bit of that in, in everyday life, right? Even after this. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a uh, that's powerful insight, almost like a positive, positive outlook, too, about what's hopeful about humanity. That's kind of what I hear you saying, too. Thank you. Totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. It's, it's very humbling and I think ultimately uh, going to make it maybe make us all better people in the long run. Fingers, mm -hmm. fingers crossed. <laughs> Max, do you have anything to add on that? I've actually escaped New York uh, for almost four weeks ago. I will need to go in next week <laughs> to, <laughs> to look after some, after some bigger wholesale orders. But other than that, I've been hiding in my little cabin uh, out in Long Island. And it's a very different situation here. I mean, people are in their houses. You don't really see anyone. You know, I only really leave the house two, three times a week to, uh, you know, go for obviously besides going for a walk or run and, uh, you know, to get groceries. So it's not as, you know, the, the, the difference to, you know, what it's usually like out here. It's not by any means as, as stark as it is in the city. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the next question is how important, and it kind of goes along with that first question, how important are health and exercise, especially right now? Tell us about that. What are you doing personally to stay healthy and exercise in this season? There's, prob there's probably two sides to that. Um, and I'll let Max talk about kind of the, the concept of like mindfulness and mental introspection. But I think uh, the other side of that coin is obviously, as you said, that physical exercise component and the importance like, uh, you know, and the intersection of like a healthy body and a healthy mind. Um, and you see that here, you know, I think the last few times when I've been running, you know, the West Side Highway here in New York City is just busier than ever. And people are really energized, I think, to engage with their bodies again. Um, there's a lot of people kind of getting their hour of exercise in or whatever it is that we're supposed to be allowed to do. Um, and I think the beauty of this situation is that you do it in a way where you kind of remove expectations from yourself. Mm -hmm. So whether that means, you know, if you're a seasoned runner, if that means kind of just maybe focusing on something like form and really uh, you know, maybe negating or removing things like speed, but just focusing on those core principles. And if you're just starting out or somewhere in the middle, maybe it's good to just remove expectations in the sense of having to run for a sustained period. Um, maybe the best way to start or one option is to run, say, for th 30 seconds and walk for a minute 
and then just play the, with the with the dynamic between the two uh, practices, so that it doesn't always have to be this like very big hurdle or barrier that one has to get through. Um, because one thing we see with running in particular is if if running is the most difficult part of your day from a perception standpoint, why would you come back and do it over and over again if, if it was that difficult? So you have to maybe create a concept of pleasure. Maybe Max, you can fill it in from the other side of the coin. Yeah, I think, you know, just being forced into a, a kind, of kind of collective retreat, you know, comes with many, many nuances, right? And sort of the combined with sort of the immediate threat of you know, a virus and illness obviously makes you pay attention to really all you know all the intricacies of, of your of your well-being in much greater in much greater depth so you know to me the conversation you know this is really something we've been working on with district vision over the last few years it's been an ongoing investigation is really where does the conversation start right in the in the body or the mind and and the the stance we're taking now as a you know as a as a group of people as a group of, of practitioners is really that it starts in the mind you know that the district versions philosophy is all around uh, really training the mind uh, through mindfulness through various forms of introspection contemplation to understand the body better right so what this increased level of, of, of just silence and, uh, and isolation allows us to do is, is just tune in to what's happening in the body much more, uh, artic in a much more articulate manner. You're just really learning to pay attention to that and, and, and use mindfulness to look at it um, with a, a sense of perspective and treat the body kindly look at you know everything that's going on with with curiosity and compassion and and then do what's good for the body we really appreciate that perspective we we had a feeling you guys would have a unique uh viewpoint and one of the things that have connected our whole team but i would say especially david and i to your brand is your perspective on the mental health the exercise the meditation and so really appreciate that insight uh, today guys that's really powerful powerful words on both perspectives the exercise and the mental aspect so thank you what outlets have you found for healthy social interaction have you found any ways to connect either a one-to-one -one or video you mentioned igtv talk talk about some of the social interaction during this time you guys have had i must say that i've been having some of the greatest most um most profound and, and and illuminating phone calls with with friends and family over the last uh, three weeks because it's 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 really incredible what you know a little bit of isolation does you know to 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 people's minds just you know the perspective it adds the clarity it adds and uh, yeah so I really think that's the that's the best we can do and just keeping in touch with people helps you yeah I mean this is the essence of our, you know, of, of this collective experience. I'm, I'm very happy that you decided picking up the phone is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> took me a while. <laughs> it took only it took a global crisis. <laughs> That's the fantastic thing, right? If you, if you deconstruct the fabric of, of society, such as what has happened here, you can understand on a personal level how you would like to reconstruct it for yourself and then the community that then obviously embodies something even greater so i think we're all going to max's point we're all going through that to some degree and we're saying to ourselves on a personal level like wait do i really want to work like that do i really want to live like that do i really want to eat like that do i really want to do that and when that happens on a personal level it's a powerful thing because we have the ability to ultimately affect change um so i personally am really i would not glorify the situation by any means and the human fallout is, is tremendously devastating but i do believe that it will land us uh in a healthier stronger place in six months it's a great perspective um yeah that's uh it's almost like you get to ch you remember your your choice the choices that we have um, right in life Right. And that's, that's a powerful, 
powerful statement. Right, totally. So you guys have obviously explore, explored your creativity outside of eyewear, and we, we tend to love basically anything you guys put out. Um, but tell us, tell us, is eyewear, do you still see eyewear as the core of your brand and explain that to us and, and some of the stuff you guys have enjoyed on the creative side, but is eyewear still your focal point? Yeah. I mean, ev everything, I sw you're going to get two different answers, which is interesting as well, probably. So I'm interested to hear Max's opinion. We, everything we do is about empowering the eyewear. So from the first kind of initial uh, additional categories like headwear and, 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 and so on, the, the way that we built it out was all about empowering that idea of the kit and building off the eyewear. So for us, it was just kind of a logical next step to offer more tools um, that can complement our offering. And then also to look back with core products that build on top of that. So some are more explicitly separate like obviously the airwear technology program which is our base layer shirts some are more connected in a literal sense like we have this uh, caitlin sports strap which fits into the temple tips and keeps the frame secure for more extreme conditions but you know for us i think if you look at classical sports companies footwear sits at the core of what they do um, and for us that's eyewear um because it's obviously, uh, it's a medical device, ultimately. And I think a lot of people, or at least we, when we started this project, forget that, you know, you're, when you come into particularly America, you're, you're FDA approved, you're, you're meeting certain requirements, obviously, as a, as, as a medical device and as an instrument to be used in sport. But then ultimately also you're, you're dealing with one of the, the most sensitive and absorbing organs and parts of the body which are obviously the eyes and there's a tremendous amount of responsibility as we as we go into these these this time of of, of new climates and infrared and uv about protecting that and kind of looking at eyewear and particularly for us sports eyewear as a a, a healthcare instrument ultimately as well as a performance object so for us it's a real passion and that's that's why we kind of started with that. What do you say, Max? I'm sure you have something to build on that too. No, I think, I think eyewear is, is, is really how it started. It's interesting that, you know, we didn't really have a strategic plan as to how District Vision was going to unfold. Uh, you know, it was, there was the, the, the approach to, to sport through the lens of, of mindfulness from the start, because that's just what what Tom and I were, were practicing ourselves. And then there was eyewear because we love eyewear and we were, we've always been obsessed with Japanese made frames. So they kind of developed in tandem. And then I would say two years in, we kind of had to, you know, had to sit down and, and figure out, okay, how are these two sides of the brand that, you know, both have a decent following, but how can we really empower the two sides to, you know, to, to make this grow and to, to, to really try and empower each other, right? We feel like we now truly understand that, that there is a need for digital tools and that physical and digital tools can, can go hand in hand. And it's work in progress, you know? We, we, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say we figured it out, but... Uh, but uh, we're enjoying the journey. <laughs> we live and we learn and we, we continue to just release the type of stuff that is true to us and that you know, we feel our community will appreciate. Yeah. I really love that you guys consider eyewear as a tool and you call it a tool because you know, you know, tools are so important in, in, in everything we do. Next question, what are you guys most excited about right now? with the future of district vision? What's, what's like on your radar? What do you, what do you have in the pipeline? I, th I think uh, on a brand level, we've, we've really used the last five years to test every feeling uh, and every opportunity within that. And, and now we feel like maybe for the first time we can take an even stronger position uh, in terms of what we feel the next generation of sports eyewear looks like, what should drive those design decisions, what should uh, 
what should dictate the output, I think, um, on a product and a brand level. And to be honest with you, we didn't have the confidence to do that in the beginning. Um, I think anyone that's followed District Vision for five years knows that it's we develop everything kind of in the public eye. So we're quite open about making mistakes and succeeding whilst equally being really careful of, of obviously what technology we develop. So I think for us, the next five years is really uh, about taking an even stronger position and being, I think, uh, even, even clearer in our intentions for that. Um, so on a product level, we have different technology platforms launching. I personally think the most exciting one is coming up and was scheduled for the Olympics, which is, a, which is not happening now, but uh, the technology is still, is still launching. We, we have particularly, specifically for eyewear, we have uh, the, the first, the industry's first truly anti-fog lens um that you guys know better than us um there's a lot of talk about that technology but it it rarely works um so we we have developed that that solution over the last three and a half years in japan and for us that's a really defining moment um because it's uh, it's been tested by ourselves it's been tested by our friends it's uh, on the bike, on the road, all different performance conditions. And it's truly a value added component that doesn't exist in the industry. So I, I, I think to simplify it down to one thing, that would be definitely my biggest passion because it's such a pain point for, I know for a lot of athletes. Yeah, I mean, that's, that can go into so many different industries, I feel like, the anti-fog, especially now with healthcare. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think the goggle guys did a really good job historically in trying to develop those solutions. But for some reason in eyewear, uh, we saw that it, it, it never had the same precedence, but it's a really familiar issue, right? It's like you're on the bike or you're running. Normally you stop the temperature of the face and the heat from the face and mixed with the, obviously the, the colder atmosphere is essentially mm -hmm. condensing the lens and then depending on the proximity of that lens to the face is how intense that experience gets so max and i just felt like that is such a simple issue why has that not been addressed um and and we have a solution that that is is phenomenal uh in terms of its function so we are we are still going to launch that uh, in its in its original phase in the summer and then you'll see the application of it uh, now the following year at the Olympics. But it's, it's, a, it's a real passion project. It's a very specific thing. Mm -hmm. And I think to Max's point, it's something that only we would, in, or only District Vision as an independent self-financed own brand by Max and I would invest in because it requires so much of, of people's time and lives to, to do that and personal friendships and so on. So I, I think that, that's something that's quite illustrative of what the way Max and I look at product development. Yeah, it's incredible. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that, actually. What do you feel like was missing in the independent eyewear industry before you guys started? I know, I mean, that's something you guys tackled as you're in the industry, but what did you feel like was something that was completely missing from, from the eyewear industry? To be quite frank, we were, we were always super passionate about eyewear. But, you know, if I remember the first time we, uh, we walked into Vision Expo, one of the, one of the big eyewear fairs, and we were, just, we were just shocked, you know? I just remember asking everyone, what have you seen that's interesting? You know? And no one could give us an answer because they were like, oh, yeah, nothing has changed here in 20 years. <laughs> like, no one's doing anything interesting. And, and you know, there are friends of ours uh, you know, Moritz from Makita and, and, you know, the boys from Vita and, and so on that are, you know, truly have been. And those are all brands that have optical cameras as well. Those are our favorite brands and the brands that we certainly look at in terms of what's new and exciting. But, 
you know, all in all, I just think the, the industry was, was spinning in circles, right? It's an, an industry that was, that was geared towards uh, serving, you know, predominantly optical stores, you know, and, you know, there's, like, you know, as I was saying earlier, it's just there isn't a lot of great optical stores out there. And, and that's, a, that's a problem, you know, we're not truly thinking about where this, you know, where the, you know, how the consumer mindset is evolving, how the, you know, the, the psychology is evolving, how we spend our lives, how we, you know, how that's all gonna, gonna affect, um, how that's all gonna affect eyewear. The, the sad truth is that it's gonna take um, a, a big technology company um, to, to change this industry. I don't think the change is gonna come from within the industry. And uh, so, yeah, we just felt like it was a little bit stagnant. And uh, we're trying to add a little bit to it. But, you know, it is tough as, a, as, an, as an independent brand. You know, what, what really we should be spending time on and as we, as we grow and hopefully have some more resources, uh, we really want to be investing in these types of technologies that can truly take, make a difference. Uh, you know, as Tom was mentioning, with, the anti-fog lens, uh, but there's so much more that could be done and we're just not even, you know, we're just basically scratching the surface. I think Gary was one of the first people we met, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And John and Jeff were trying to convince Gary that Max and I were in a relationship. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and we kept, we kept asking as we were trying to figure out distribution, we kept, I kept texting Jeff and John, it was like, can you just send us a list of like the 20, 20 stores that are like Gary's store. And they just couldn't, <laughs> just couldn't respond. They're like, there is no store like that. It's like, but this is where we need to sell. Like, no, that doesn't exist. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible how relationships start. And I know you guys do some really interesting collaborations. Is there a dream collaboration that you guys would like be the, the upper top tier? I don't know about you, Max, but I think we have it, but it's coming out in two years. Mm. So we can't really talk about it, but I think we have it. At least we have my dream one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think in terms of like the next three to five years, we, it's, it looks like we have the, the, the best collaboration we could be doing. And, you know, and then other than that, I really think we should be looking more at the technology, basically the eye as, a, as the last frontier final frontier of consuming digital digital content uh, evolves then you know there are the, obviously the big the big tech players like apple and so on that will be the ultimate the ultimate brands to collaborate with i love that cliffhanger yeah. two years i love that <laughs> you guys are planning ahead so kind of on a personal level do you guys i know i've never actually seen tom in a frame except for like a running frame but do you guys have a personal frame that's in your collection that you just love or you can't live without? We, before we were, we were, let's say, before we were designing, we were collecting. Um, so we have a lot of different ones. I just had my eyes lasered uh, three months ago, weirdly enough. So before that, I was, you know, we, we were wearing whatever was in the factory. So we, we always wore Tom Brown obviously always had just such a big respect for what John and Jeff achieved with Dita. That was our introduction to eyewear. We, we actually, the only store I think that's vaguely on Black Opticals level that at least I know is, is Steenie's store, which is called the Eye Company on Wardour Street in London. And he, he introduced us to Dita. And then that's kind of indirectly how we got in touch with John and Jeff. So we always had so much respect with how John and Jeff learned to work with metals, acetates, injection, kind of uh, lenses, uh, and particularly obviously the, the family that, that they work with. We always had so much respect for obviously everything they create. And then, and then just looking back, I think, and seeing how well things used to be done on a product level, you know, and just seeing how, how that has evolved in terms of like to 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 work with this more fast moving consumer goods society i think if you look at the old puzzles and you look at the old um uh 
Boeing, Carreras, and all that type of stuff, you see a quality of craftsmanship that is quite stunning. And obviously, to a degree that when productions were moved, when supply chains were swallowed by conglomerates, there was a race to the bottom in terms of quality. And ultimately, this thing sits on your face. So you, you, you want to be a little bit cognizant of that, of, of kind of what, what that is, right? So I think we, we have a real soft spot for those types of brands that, that just executed on a, on, a, on a material and shape and style level that was so directional for its time. What frame? Is there a frame for you, Max, that hits a soft spot? Yeah, there are certain archive pieces, definitely. I don't know, you know, I don't know the specific model names, but obviously 60s, 60s per salt stuff is, 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 is what always always gets me going. But in terms of frames that I've, I've worn, like I've, I, I first started wearing this Tom Brown frame four years ago or something, and then I've tried many other ones since, but like nothing works quite as well as this one. So I always keep coming back to this. So. Uh, it really seems to be the just the right amount of character and uh, lightness and just sort of impeccable craftsmanship as you know you would expect. I'm gonna give this a shot, but is that the 718 TV 718 or something like that? I mean, it I is. Think it is. I think it is. 718. Yeah. yeah. Good work, David. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I thought it was the 718 as well, because right? I, I remember reading it on your temple next so many times. 701. 701, <laughs> close. Uh, yeah, the in, the sevens, in the sevens, in the sevens. I love that. I, that. Yeah. That's a great, yeah, it's a, it's, it just fits your, it fits your style, Max. I love that. I feel like if I saw you in something else, I wouldn't know what to know what to do. Yeah, I remember John and Jeff saying when they first, they didn't really believe in the frame, but then when they saw me in it, they truly understood. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, now it's carryover. <laughs> yeah. I, don't know if that was, I couldn't tell if that was a joke or true, but either way, it was fantastic. Yeah, I, I could have gone with it either way. If he would have kept a straight face, I would have gone with him. <laughs> Uh, who is inspiring you or your brand right now? So we just kind of want to think like it can be an eyewear or just separate from eyewear, artists, authors, designers, anything really that's anyone who is inspiring you personally or your brand. That's a really good question. I remember one of the Max, we kind of connected on Thich Nhat Hanh, um, a few years back. And so that's been, that's been one I've, I've remembered that kind of has inspired you, that uh, author. So, but anyone else or any other thoughts here? He's incredible. Honestly, the, the people that we've been speaking to over the last uh, over the last few weeks have been tremendously inspiring. I mean, I was lucky enough to to interview Sam Harris, the neuroscientist philosopher, uh, in January, and you know he's definitely one of my heroes. He's one of the true true maverick a true independent thinker and and you know we're now doing some work with him so you know, that's been a huge gift and then tom and i interviewed rich wall on monday or tuesday and he's just such a great guy and truly someone who is you know so well spoken and articulate and and you know such a big heart and and is truly the the um you know, I would say the the epitome of of a muscular athlete. Thank you for giving me the chance to remember mine, Max. Uh, I think I'll I'll choose uh, uh, George Nakashima, uh, the woodworker. Uh, I I visited his his woodworking shop in New Hope, Pennsylvania, I believe, uh, maybe a year ago, uh, and he has kind of a really interesting story because. After the Second World War, he was in, as a Japanese person, he was put into an internment camp in the U.S. in, in, in Idaho. And then he was sponsored out by a farmer in, in New Hope that gave him land and the, and the workshop where he created all of his furniture. And when you see that set up, at least for Max and I, it, it kind of, 
it helped me at least to project the life that we wanted um, in terms of having a certain integration of like how we work and our personal lives. For Max it's, and I, it's a bit different because we've known each other 15, 16 years. So we, we, we probably see more intersection or we probably see a different role of what work plays in our lives than maybe someone who, who sees something as a job. Um, for us, this is not really a job. It's, it's more of a, a, a form, as we always say, district vision is more of a form of personal therapy for both of us. Um, so that, that Nakashima setup was truly inspiring and you can take different things from everyone and kind of put them together and then find your own approach to life. And I think that's kind of what district vision ultimately presents to us. Absolutely. Thank you for those answers.